Eh, okay. Inalil, eh, muy buenos días a todos. Eh, nuevamente, un sábado de usted Latinoamérica. A continuación, tenemos el honor de, de presentar a, a un excelente profesional, alguien con, con, con una marcada trayectoria a nivel europeo eh, y a nivel mundial en lo que es el ámbito de la nefrología y del ultrasonido en nefrología propiamente dicho. En este caso es el doctor Pier Paolo Di Nicolò, nefrólogo y ultrasonografista, investigador, autor de múltiples artículos y capítulos de libros, el último de ellos sobre imagen en nefrología, con todo un grupo italiano bastante sólido, con el doctor eh, Francesco Corradi, con el doctor Antonio Granata, por nombrar algunos de ellos, eh, quien se desempeña en el servicio de nefrología y la unidad de diálisis del Hospital Santa María de la Escaleta en Imola, Italia. Eh, les pido excusas por mi dominio del inglés, eh, esperando que disfruten la presentación. Eh, good afternoon, doctor. It's an honor for us to have you in this Saturday Thanks. with such an interesting presentation about the use of ultrasound in nephrology. I say goodbye for now. You can start with your presentation when you decide. Thank you. I, I want to thank everybody for coming here. Thanks to Dr. Martinez for this kind and welcome invitation. And I'm happy to talk about uh, the hemodialysis and ultrasonography. And uh, at first, uh, I think that we have to uh, clarify the role of point-of-care ultrasonography. What is point-of-care ultrasonography? It, it is the performing of ultrasound examinations at the patient bedside for diagnostic and therapeutic purposes. And POCUS completes, enhances, and supports the physical examination. As you can see on the slide, I have my stethoscope with me. But for POCUS in hemodialysis setting, different ultrasound equipments can be used. As you can see on the left, I'm using a traditional machine here, while on the right side of the slide, my great trainee, Dr. Luisa Vitale, is using a portable device. Traditionally, in hemodialysis, POCUS was employed for the study of vascular access, for example, arteriovenous fistula. But now it's important to say that there are a lot of emerging applications. And uh, one of the main um, area of study with ultrasonography is the volemic state that for end stage renal disease patient is of crucial importance. And in, in this webinar, we'll talk about this aspect. Okay, um, let's start from the clinical context. The end stage renal disease is characterized by a profound impairment in the regulation of body fluid distribution. And uh, volume assessment in, the, in hemodialysis is one of the challenging goals for the nephrologist. Uh, th this aspect is crucial both in chronic and acute hemodialysis setting. Uh, as you can see in the slide, in chronic hemodialysis patients treated by a standard duration treatment, we have a bidiurnal variation of the fluid status. As you can see, between the two different dialysis sessions, in this part, that is in the interdialytic period, the patient take gains, uh, gains weight, pardon, gains weight because of fluid retention. The excess of water uh, will then be removed here during the next dialysis, thanks to ultrafiltration. So what the aspect that is crucial is that we, the nephrologists, decide the amount of ultrafiltration. We can decide how and how much to obtain the optimal fluid status, the euvolemia for that patient. Um, and uh, so the next answer, the next question could be why achieving the current dry weight is so, so important for the nephrologist. But we have to say that acute or chronic volume overload are very frequent in hemodialysis, um, in chronic setting, but also for acute kidney injury patients. And this fact carries important aftermath in terms of survival. You can see this aspect on the left panel, where the mortality is much higher for, pa for patients with positive uh, the fluid balance. 
On the right panel of the slide, you see that the association between the, the, the fluid overload at the time of continuous renal replacement therapy um, is, is connected with the major adverse kidney events. So as you can see in the graphs, fluid overload greater than 10% at the time, at the time of uh, renal replacement therapy initiation was associated with increased risk of major adverse kidney events. So it's very important for us to obtain the correct dry weight. Um, to avoid the volume overload, uh, we, um, it, it, it's an important aspect, but it's also the most difficult to obtain. And uh, to, to obtain so, uh, to obtain the uvolemic status, or what we call uh, currently the dry weight, together with the clinical evaluation that is inaccurate and such as subjective, um, we have a lot of novel techniques that we can employ sometime together in a comprehensive assessment strategy that this author, Rosner and other, I'll call the 5B approach. So we have the body weight changes with the, the normal physical examination, that is the blood the volume online monitoring that can be done during the hemodialysis session. We have the biomarkers, a lot of, for example, BNP, B-natriuretic peptide, and also the bioimpedance, that is another important technique. But uh, ultrasonography is one of these parts, and uh, in my opinion, is uh, perhaps uh, uh, one of the most important. And uh, in dialysis, in hemodialysis, we can use uh, uh, a lot of technique connected with ultrasonography. So um let's clear another aspect we have two different forms of congestion we have the intravascular congestion and we have the tissue congestion the majority of patients have a combination of both uh, these types of congestion but one phenotype can dominate in this show in the in this figure is a show uh, that uh, uh, the clinical signs, the biomarkers, and other techniques can help us um, to diagnose to the diagnosis of a congestion. Um, ultrasonography is present in, in, in both parts of this type of congestion. We can use, for example, pulmonary ultrasonography for tissue congestion, and we can use inferior vena cava ultrasonography and renal Doppler ultrasonography for detect intravascular congestion. And um, indeed, we have a lot of districts in which we can combine ultrasonography, we can, where we can use point of care ultrasonography to obtain information about congestions. Here are presented the focus strategies to assess congestion in hemodialysis patients and uh, strategies we can apply only with a convex probe. So we have the lung ultrasonography, we have the Vexus, this is the venous excess ultrasound grading system, we'll talk of this aspect later. We have the focus cardiac ultrasound that for time reason we cannot treat here. And uh, we have on the right side represented uh, the compartmental phenotypes of congestion that we can um, see with the focus. So we have a uh, a, a, a typical sign of no congestion, we have uh, a predominant tissue congestion, we have a predominant vascular congestion, and we have a mixed congestion. Using all these techniques of um, ultrasonography, of POCUS, we can try to detect all these type of congestion. Starting from the lung ultrasonography, we have to say that uh, um, when we study the thorax, when we study in particular the lung, we are making a sort of study of artifacts because the use techniques involves the passage of ultrasound emitted by the probe through a series of physical interfaces, solid or liquid. The presence of air generally prevents the transmission of the ultrasound waves. And for that reason, until in recent times, the lungs were considered organs poorly or completely inexplorable with ultrasound techniques. Um, however, the pathological conditions that reduce the amount of air and increase the fluid component in the pulmonary parenchyma make it amenable to examination by ultrasonography. 
Uh, in this case, as I have already said, the echography is not performed through the analysis of the morphology of the organ, but uh, rather through the study of the artifacts that the disease has generated. As you can see in these graphics, um, uh, we see that when there is less air, we can see more parts of the lung and different aspects of the lung. Um, when we are talking about the, the artifacts, we have, uh, we have two types of artifacts. Um, at first, we have to say that chest ultrasonography can be performed with the linear phased array or convex probes and with a range from uh, 2.5 up to 7.5 megahertz. Um, harmonic or fundamental imaging can both be used. There are no important differences. And it's so useful to set the penetration depth. I use four to eight centimeters starting from the pleural line. Um, if you can, it, it's right to, to, to focus the image at the level of the pleural line to concentrate most of the energy for reflection and reverberating. Um, in this slide, we have two types of reverberation artifacts determined by the lung surface. We have these ones are the so-called A lines uh, that are horizontal repetition artifacts without the precise clinical meaning in the dialysis setting. But obviously, uh, if you have A lines and pleural sliding sign, according to Lichtenstein, you can say that this is a normal aerated lung. On the other side, we have the B-lines that originate from the pleural line, cover the entire screen, and have a vertical trend, just like a laser. And B-lines are of particular importance in situation of lung water overload, and they are considered the real hallmark of congestion. This is, we have here only one B-line. And uh, for, for the technique, for the technique uh, we have different possibilities. If we have much time, we can do this one that is the so-called 28 rib interspaces technique that can be well applied uh, and in my opinion is the best that we can use. Um, as you can see, for each of these points, we have a, uh, a region of exploration and uh, um, this is the anterior posterior view of a CT scan. The scanning is performing with a probe placed in the intercostal spaces along the parasternal and mid clavicular lines on both hemithorax. Obviously here we have a, a less point because we have the heart. Uh, on, the, on this uh, other part, we have a right lateral lateral view. The translucence is placed along the anterior and mid axillary lines, generally from the second to the fifth interscostal space. Um, but obviously, if we have not much time, there are shorter methods that are taking one minute or less. Uh, focus on eight or just four points, as you can see here. Uh, for example, the foresight score measures the number of B lines uh, only in the third interscostal space in two areas per side of the thorax. Mm, it's important to say that now we have automated, automated software on the basis of artificial intelligence that, that, uh, that are in our machines. Uh, so uh, this, this kind of artificial intelligence may allow operator independent quantification of lung water. Just a moment, okay. Okay, um, with the lung ultrasonography, we obtain a, a quantitative or semi-quantitative evaluation of interstitial lung water uh, because we can count the B lines. So um, in each intercostal space, the comets are counted from zero to 10. And in the case of their confluence, the percentage of the rib space covered by B lines is estimated. The component of extravascular lung water is considered absent or mild when up to a total number of 15 comets are detected. We have a, a moderate kind of congestion, a moderate, moderate degree of congestion from 16 to 30 uh, B lines or comets, if you prefer. And we can talk about a serious congestion uh, or quite a interstitial syndrome if we are more than 30 B lines. 
Now, uh, there is an aspect that I think is very important for every colleague, for every doctor who uses POCUS and uh, who focuses attention on the lung ultrasonography. When we are talking about uh, hemodialysis patient or end-stage renal disease patient, uh, we have to consider the, so the so-called hidden lung congestion. This is an interesting concept. Um, it's the idea that a state of a chronic volume expansion of a variable degree is prevalent in patients with renal impairment. Uh, in this study, for example, we have um, 20 and 70 hemodialysis patients in which thoracic, in which the chest ultrasonography revealed a moderate to severe pulmonary congestion in 58% of the subject, of which 38 were completely asymptomatic. And a strong association between physical functioning and pulmonary congestion was found, as you can see here in this uh, uh, physical functioning score. So what are we saying? We are saying that in end-stage renal population, uh, asymptomatic pulmonary fluid overload is often present and it remains clinically silent. It can over time negatively impact the quality of life and survival of uh, hemodialysis or end-stage renal disease patients. And uh, lung ultrasonography has the great power, the sensibility, the sensitivity to unveil this clinical aspect. For example, the, this is one of our patients, a patient uh, of a 76 years old a woman uh, in a hemodialytic patient without dyspnea or fatigue, but with this kind of uh, uh, lung ultrasonography examination with a lot of B lines, as you can see. So we have a clear sign of extravascular lung water expansion without symptoms. So last uh, lung ultrasonography has been confirmed to be superior in sensitivity to clinical signs of fluid overload. For example, such as lung crackles and peripheral edema. Lung crackles, lung crackles either alone or combined with the peripheral edema, very poorly reflect interstitial lung edema in patients in patient with end-stage renal disease. Uh, lung ultrasonography reveals pulmonary congestion in 65% of the instances, while clinical size were helpful only in 21%. So we have in this slide, the correlation between, between the severity of a lung congestion as detected by lung ultrasonography uh, with the pulmonary crackles here and the peripheral edema here. As you can see, this is a poor correlation between lung ultrasonography, B lines, and the clinical sign of lung congestion. So, why the, there is this discrepancy between a clinical sign and the last score and lung ultrasonography score? It's not surprising, indeed, because lung ultrasonography, as I've already said, can detect hidden lung before the appearance of any clinical sign. Last, can, lung ultrasonography can only evaluate extravascular lung water, but unlike other techniques used in dialysis setting, for example, by impedance, uh, it can not directly assess the total amount of body water of a patient. On the other side, we have a clinical size that have low sensitivity and specificity for detecting interstitial lung edema. Um, another aspect, a very important aspect for our patient is that the uremic heart is characterized by cardiomyocyte dysfunction and cardiac function is often deeply impaired in end-stage renal disease. So we can appreciate another crucial aspect of uh, chest ultrasonography. The relationship between B lines and pulmonary pressure or uh, left ventricular feeling pressure uh, is a, a strong relationship. As you can see here, um, extravascular lung water can be strictly correlated to, to pulmonary pressure or to left ventricular filling pressure. And with the escalation of the degree of pulmonary edema, the number of B lines can rise proportionally. However, the relationship between B lines and the capillary pressure is not ex exclusive and it's possible to obtain increasing comets or B lines, increasing B lines, even when pulmonary pressures are normal. 
or they are normal. Uh, in this case, probably the role, the pivotal role for increased extravascular lung water is played by augmented pulmonary vascular permeability. As it happens, for example, in, uh, in case of acute respiratory distress syndrome. So uh, now that we, that we have explained all these aspects, we can appreciate the physiopathological sequence for the appearance of the B-lines in hemodialysis. We have at first increased the lung permeability and the heart impairment that are indeed the real responsible for extravascular lung expansion, while the overload, the systemic value overload, has a role, but probably is a secondary role. So the presence of different interfaces produces the comet tail artifacts, the B-lines, which can be appreciated early by chest ultrasound when we have the hidden lung phase. But with the progression of a lung testicial syndrome, the transition between preclinical and clinical phase of course, together with B-lines quantitative increase. As you can see here, from a preclinical phase to a clinical phase. But as you can see here, lung ultrasonography can detect this stage when the clinical phase is silent. In a, a, a very, very important aspect, this is a, an historical work by Nobel et al. At is that lung ultrasonography has the ability to detect and estimate the degree of extravascular lung water in a dynamic way, in a dynamic way, so that a quantitative reduction of B-lines can be appreciated in real time during the dialysis session in a proportion to fluid volumes removed by ultrafiltration. So we have in this, in this slide, the percentage of B-lines versus time and B-lines versus volume removed. This data supports the hypothesis that B-lines are likely present before clinical symptoms of dyspnea, and therefore B-lines may be an early marker of extravascular lung water. And instead of using a patient's body weight, lung ultrasonography finds it could be a more direct measure of volume overload, and the, abs the absence of B-lines could suggest uvolemia more appropriately than patient's body weight. The, you, you can see in the slide that decrease of 2.7 B-lines uh, arrives for every um, 500 milliliters of volume removed with ultrafiltration. Now we arrive to the, to the final question, to the final point. Can lung ultrasonography guided treatment strategy improve the morbidity and the mortality of the patients in hemodialysis? The answer is uh, complex. Has uh, this famous study, that is the last study, was a multicenter randomized and controlled trial conducted on uh, uh, 307 uh, patients, hemodialysis patients, uh, with a follow up of uh, more than a year, um, tried to answer to this question. And uh, it failed to um, show a, a, a um, a, a clear correlation for lung ultrasonography and the outcome. So lung ultrasonography did not reduce mortality. Uh, we don't know that if the problem was the fact that uh, uh, decongestion is a slow and long process and effects on this intervention on heart outcomes might take longer time than that uh, um, taken by the study. Uh, so we have not an answer for this no, uh, no, for this unsuccess, for this uh, failed uh, answer. But uh, we have to we have to say that uh, anyway, um, lung ultrasonography in this study safely relieved the lung congestion, and this is the first point. The second point is that lung ultrasonography um, was connected. Uh, with fewer episodes of intradialytic hypotension. So probably lung ultrasonography detected those patients who will benefit, who will tolerate more ultrafiltration. 
we have to say that there was also a post hoc anal analysis of the last trial that showed that the lung ultrasonography reduced the risk of repeated episode of uh, acute heart failure. But this is a post hoc analysis um, we ha I have not reported here. So lung ultrasonography can be considered very, very important in hemodialysis. But if you, are, if you are talking about the prognostic role, uh, we have to say that uh, this study has not shown this role, has not um, revealed this role for lung ultrasonography. When we use lung ultrasonography, we can do another important things. So we, we can study the pleural effusion. This is, for example, a patient, a 70 year old patient, can just moved to our nephro unit without history. Uh, when I make my ultrasound examination, I found this kind of uh, ultrasound atlas with both the types of pleural effusions. We have on the left side an exudate empyema, and on the right side, we have a transudate as you can see from the echographic aspects, uh, ultrasonography aspects here. And uh, you can see the, the CT scan of these patients that are in which the, 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 the effusion, the massive effusion can be clearly shown also by ultrasonography. Okay, let's go. Um, we can quantify, we can reliably quantify the pleural effusion with POCUS. And there is this GEX formula, you can take this one as it's very important to to really quantify uh, the pleural effusion, it's quite there is a great accuracy, and it's it's much more sensitive than than X-ray. Okay, so finally we can say that the lung ultrasonography is a useful tool for the evaluation of a cardiogenic pulmonary congestion. That multiple bilines pattern um, uh, can be considered a sonographic hallmark of lung edema that the lung ultrasonography is superior to standard chest X-ray, that the lung ultrasonography has extended its field of clinical application from cardiology and intensive care setting to hemodialysis, and that the lung ultrasonography can detect um, those patients, those hemodialysis patients who will tolerate more ultrafiltration. Uh, talking about inferior renal cava, that is another aspect we can study in our hemodialysis patient, um, we can say that uh, with 85% of a total plasma volume in the venous circulation, the inferior vena cava is an important blood reservoir and the modifications of the circulating volume result in IVC, inferior vena cava caliber variations. Note that the patient position and the cubitus can influence the circulating blood volume and IVC diameter um, by gravity. So uh, the IVC is smaller when the patient e is in the left lateral position and the, the IVC is larger when the patient is in the right lateral position. So we have to say that the behavior of the, of the IVC is the result of a complex interplay between the heart, the volemia, and the respiratory mechanisms. Mm, this is a, a simple um, graphic to show that uh, uh, this interplay is clearly visible during a sp spontaneous breathing. As you can see, um, as you can see, the, the IVC diameter decreases with the descent of the diaphragm, abdominal uh, prominent. When you, we have the descent of the diaphragm, the abdominal pressure rises. But we have that infratoracic pressures increases its negativity. So right atrial pressures goes down. The hemodynamic counterpart to, to this toraco abdominal interaction is the increase in blood return from the IVC to the right atrium, leading to a secondary reduction in the, side, in the size of the IVC and a transient increase in the stroke volume. O obviously, when you have exhalation, we have uh, uh, the opposite of all these aspects. And uh, this is a graphic we have made uh, together with Professor Corradi uh, to show that uh, we have a five ab above above uh, five uh, pardon, almost 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 five determinants uh, which can affect inferior vena cava diameter uh, that here are shown with the related clinical conditions. So you can see that thoracic pressure, cardiac function, abdominal pressure, the inferior vena cava parietal compliance and blood volume 
all are determinant of the diameter of the inferior vena cava. It's not only a blood volume problem. Uh, here are shown also the, the clinical conditions connected with the, each determinant. And uh, as you can see here, it's a complex interplay. Here it, it is the classical, uh, the classical uh, vision of the inferior vena cava that is usually visualized from a subcostal, subxiphoid sub view by a longitudinal scan, including the veno-arterial junction. In a case of suboptimal sub or unavailable subcostal window, we, we can use a coronal transhepatic scan, but this is a, a sort of low quality alternative. After we have uh, see the, seen the inferior vena cava, we can use the Doppler M mode. Uh, the exact position for the measure is not universally standardized, and most authors suggest that measurements should be acquired within 1.5 centimeters from the IVC to right atrial junction. Um, and uh, it's important to say that the minimum, minimum venous diameter in spontaneously breathing patients may be influenced by inspiratory effort. So if you can have a maximal inspiration with the sniffing maneuver, this one, um, we can, we can, no, I have not explained this aspect. So it's important to standardize, to standardize the procedures. So uh, since the minimum venous diameter uh, may be influenced by the inspiratory effort, with the sniffing maneuver, you can have this, this, uh, this, uh, this aspect standardized. Um, while you have the maximal IVC diameter at the end of the expiration. So we have two, two kinds of measure. We have the static parameters that are this one, so the maximum and minimum IC, IVC diameters. And uh, then we can combine these two aspects to obtain the collapsibility index. That is a diameter um, uh, dynamic. So we have uh, also a parameter that is dynamic a K, and that can, it then can be derived from this formula. So static parameters, IVC max and IVC min can be combined in this kind of formula to obtain a dynamic evaluation of inferior vena cava. Um, here, you can see that um, the, the, the current updated American and European guidelines. So we can have, uh, which combines these two aspects I have already explained. So um, the, the, the diameter, the static measure, and the dynamic measure here, that is the, um, the collapsibility index uh, derived from this formula. And that are combined to, to obtain the right atrial pressure. Indeed, Indeed, in, uh, so you can combine this, uh, this aspect during the ultrasound examination to say which is the right atrial pressure. Indeed, in hemodialysis, the standardization of, of IVC diameter to body surface area is recommended. So as you can see here, this is, uh, this is the combination of these, two, of these two aspects. And we have a new, a new table different from this one because we have uh, this kind of uh, indexed, indexed IVC um, evaluation. And uh, una, another important aspect we have to say is that uh, searching for an association between the IVC and the BLI score uh, some studies have compared the lung ultrasonography to inferior vera cava diameter in hemodialysis patients. Uh, the results are quite heterogeneous uh, and I say conflicting, but we try to, to synthesize. Um, the ultrasonography of inferior vena cava reflects fluid status, but connection between lung ultrasonography and IVC appears strong only in pre-dialysis evaluation. So uh, I, I will say that IVC evaluation with the static diameters has a modest sensitivity for detecting changes in fluid status in hemodialysis. And 
the IVC evaluation with the static diameter is clearly inferior to Lang ultrasonography. But, but, uh, just a moment, we have, <laughs> I guess a blue. Uh, just a moment, I have, okay, okay. Um, okay. Oh, okay, we are here. On the other side, when we use the dynamic parameters, I have said the collapsibility index with the formula that we have shown, correlates with plasma volume removal by ultrafiltration in continuous and also in intermittent hemodialysis. In this group of 24 patients with acute compensated heart failure during slow continuous ultrafiltration, you can see that the collapsibility index here is clearly affected by ultrafiltration, while static diameters are not. And uh, in the study, we see that the occurrence of a, a collapsibility a Caval index superior to 30% 30, 30 um, during the, 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 the ultrafiltration was correlated with hypotension. So we can say that serial collapsibility index of the vena cava measurements during the ultrafiltration can monitor intravascular volume and identify patients at risk of hypotension. So we can optimize the fluid removal rate through this inferior vena cava index. Uh, most dialysis centers practice the clinical judgments for dry weight estimation, but this is a subjective and can differ uh, from the actual weight. Why not, why not associate lung ultrasonography and IVC? Um, in the study, after a period of two weeks um, of a clinically estimated dry weight, then it was redefined using lung ultrasonography and IVC uh, collapsibility index combined. And the symptoms of a volume overload and or volume depletion before and after modifying the dry weight were documented. The results were that symptoms related to, va to volume overload and depletion were less when hemodialysis prescription was based on a lung and IVC, inferior vena cava ultrasonography combined. So we can say that inferior vena cava measurements may be relatively inferior when used alone and when used with static measure. So inferior vena cava diameter at the end of the expiration of inferior vena cava at the end of, uh, of exhalation. But if we integrate inferior vena cava and lung ultrasonography, you can have a better estimation of the volume status as they measure separate compartments of body water. Oh, just a moment. Okay. And here we, we are uh, using another aspect. We are studying another district of the body. We are trying now to, uh, to study um, together uh, the, not only the lung at the inferior cava, but also the liver and the kidney. Um, because this aspect has been proposed to minimize the interpretative drawback, interpretative drawbacks of the inferior vena cava, and ultrasound probe to to, to make to make this kind of examination can be uh, placed here to have a clear location of uh, the hepatic uh, uh, veins or the portal veins, or here if we want to see the um, venous uh, parenchymal, uh, renal parenchymal veins. Um, let's start from hepatic vein Doppler. In my opinion, it's one of the most interesting. Um, in the hepatic vein Doppler is characterized by four, four waves. Um, we have the A wave that is an agile contraction with blood in two directions, anterograde toward the right ventricle and the retrograde toward IVC here. Then we have the ventricular systole 
with blood into the right ventricular outflow tract, then we have the V wave, in which we have a, a transitional wave um, because the circuspid valve um, arrives to a resting position and blood flow velocity uh, toward the heart decreases. Then we have the D wave, that is a ventricular diastole, in which the circuspid valve opens and the blood goes to the heart. It's very important to say that when we uh, perform hepatic vein Doppler, we have to use uh, we have to use simultaneous electrographic trace. And uh, for the hepatic vein Doppler, one of the main features is that is pulsatile, and it is a right atrial pressure related. Uh, because the hepatic vein waveform in realtà uh, reflects the pressure changes in the right atrium during the cardiac cycle. And the S and D waveforms that are here remain anterograde when the right atrial pressure is not elevated. But when we have the elevation of right atrial pressure, we have the reverse of the S wave. Uh, and generally speaking, when we have a normal aspect of this trace, we have the S wave that is larger than the D wave. As you can see here, there is an inversion also of the, um, of, of the measure of the wave wave. And here there is the reverse of the S wave. So during progressive liver congestion, the ratio of systolic to diastolic flow continues to decrease. And in severe congestion, the systolic flow becomes reverse. And this is due to a progressive decline in right atrial compliance, secondary to volume overload. Uh, portal vein Doppler is another important aspect that you can see with the same scan that I have, I have showed before. And the portal vein Doppler has the feature of being continuous and expresses visceral venous pressure. Um, generally speaking, in the portal vein, there is no pulsation. The portal flow is a low velocity continuous flow that uh, um, is uh, the one showed here. But uh, when we have a, 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 an increment, a, a rising of a congestion, we have uh, uh, the appearance of monophasic or biphasic P wave waveforms. Um, and you can also see often the respiratory variation. So with the progressive liver congestion, portal venous flow becomes increasingly pulse, pulsatile. And the portal vein pulsatility is also a measure of portal hypertension and can be found in patients with end stage liver disease. So it's not exclusive of the congestion. We have, we have to underline this aspect. Regarding the real veil Doppler, I have to say that in hemodialysis patients, uh, it's very difficult to be obtained as we have uh, an atrophic kidney. So it's quite difficult to obtain a clear uh, flow in the, in the renal venous system. But anyway, venous flow in the intrarenal parenchymal vessels uh, measure at the level of the corticomedullary junction uh, is uh, not pulsatile in a normal condition. As you can see here, it's a linear flow, but um, with a progressive increase in kidney intracapsular pressure and congestion, we have the, the evolution of the morphology of the trace. Here is shown the, the, the physiopathological aspect which underlines this modification of, of the wave. And this aspect is so-called the renal tamponade that is a new term, but I think that we will um, we'll see often uh, in the future this term because it, is, it clearly explains the renal venous hypertension of, if you want, uh, the congestive kidney. That is a, a precise disease. This is a, a clear entity that we see when we have the cardiorenal syndrome, for example. And uh, in mild to moderate congestion, the pulsatile intrarenal venous flow comes biphasic and then comes monophasic when we have a progressive congestion. Uh, the, the, the important question now for me is, which are the evidence for the use of pulsed wave Doppler in clinical scenarios of congestion? 
um, we have this study uh, of uh, 2018. Uh, that is a study on 145 uh, patients undergoing cardiac surgery, okay? You can see that the alteration in portal vein and in intrarenal venous flow in the perioperative period were markers of venous congestion and correlated with acute kidney injury. So were prognostic adverse factors. Uh, we have then two other important uh, studies later in time. That is on the left, this, uh, this study uh, on uh, cardiac surgery patients in, in which was assessed the prognostic role of portal, vein plo, uh, portal venous flow pulsatility. And uh, here was shown that the portal flow pulsatility greater than 50% was associated with right ventricular dysfunction and major complications. On the right, another observational study enrolling more than 100 adult ICU patients in which the portal vein was considered abnormal if, uh, um, if we have uh, um, here the, uh, um, the, a diastolic wave larger than a systolic wave or a clear in reverse or S of S wave, as I said before. And uh, also the, the, the portal pulsatility was studied here. And um, here we say that um, there was an increase in major events when abnormalities, severe abnormalities were both present in uh, hepatic and portal veins. But in this case, the, the, the alteration of, of renal compartments were, were not associated with adverse outcome. So renal Doppler here was not predictive. Only uh, liver uh, Doppler was predictive of the outcome. Um, after this premise, I have to, 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 to show this, this one, that is the, the famous VEXUS study, which is starting from the IBC examination, uh, was analyzed the, the power Doppler flow patterns of hepatic veins, portal veins, and renal parenchymal veins. The aim of the single center perspective work uh, in patient undergoing cardiac surgery was to develop a prototype grading system combining multiple ultrasound markers of congestion and to validate its potential clinical value. In post-cardiac surgery, VEXUS C grade three, that is this one underlined here, uh, which was defined by the presence of severe, severe flow abnormalities in at least two vascular beds, along with a dilated IVC, so larger than two centimeters in diameter. So these here, these abnormalities predicted congestive acute kidney injury, and in this case, outperformed, outperformed central venal pressure measurement. Here you can see the, 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 the so-called VEXUS grading system derived from the study, that is the venous excess ultrasound uh, system. And uh, I want to underline an aspect of this uh, uh, Doppler evaluation, is that uh, the, the, the congestion can be considered only if we have an IVC diameter greater than two centimeters. In other terms, IVC diameter is a sine qua non condition to consider congestion. Um, uh, this is another, another uh, image showing this kind of grading system in which, as you can see, with the expansion of inferior vena cava, with the modification of hepatic vein trace Doppler or portal vein pulsatility or modification of intrarenal vein trace, you have more congestion. But I have also to show this study that is quite recent in which uh, uh, ICU patients, more than 100 adult patients, were studied with the VEXOS grading system. And uh, here, indeed, uh, the prevalence of systemic venous congestion assessed by the VEXOS score was low. And probably because a lot of patients admitted to the ICU uh, were there 
for non-cardiac reason, for example, septic shock or stroke. So they do not necessarily present a high prevalence of a cardiac disease and a hypervolemia. And another point to say is, the, is that in this study, admission of exus super grading superior to or equal to two was not associated with acute kidney injury. So the authors uh, uh, writes this statement that the utility of a vexus in all ICU patients should be reconsidered. This is an important statement. But anyway, we have to say that uh, case reports are described in which is reported the utility of a point of care ultrasonography using uh, power pulsed with Doppler for the initial evaluation and the follow up of a patient with cardiorenal syndrome, for example. Here we have an example in which uh, the, uh, uh, there was an acute kidney injury. The patient was studied in different time of, the, of this clinical evaluation with the point of care ultrasonography and uh, the vexus was, was used here, uh, a precise vexus, uh, and it uh, uh, allowed um, to uh, reach the diagnosis and to monitor the congestion, the decongestion process. To conclude, we can say that venous congestion assessment with pulsed wave Doppler um, in hemodialysis has not indeed uh, uh, clear evidences. I have showed uh, evidences from other from other area uh, of other clinical area that are not uh, the end stage renal disease. And uh, pulses with Doppler for me is is in say promising for me and also for for, for a part of of the clinical literature, but uh, um, but um, there is for me an important uh, uh, aspect to correct that is uh, that IVC ultrasonography is considered a gateway to eventual splanctic investigation. In the, in the vexus. And this aspect is questionable as a some degree of splanchnic congestion can be present independently from IVCC behavior. I will show you uh, how is complex the behavior of IVC. So considering it a sort of gateway to evaluate the congestion, in my personal opinion, can be a bias. But anyway, I use it, I, use, I personally use the, this kind of a system. Uh, I tried my patient in order to obtain uh, a dry weight when I, when, I, when I work in hemodialysis. And I see, I clearly see what many other colleagues uh, say in other reports. So that in hemodialysis, we have a visible modification of doppel traces. But finally, we have to say that further studies are necessary to validate this grid system in different clinical setting. Uh, for example, hemodialysis, and to evaluate its impact on the outcomes. I thank you all for, for your attention and for your patience. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, gracias a todos. And uh, sorry for my English. <laughs> thank you. Well, Dr. Di, Di Nicolo, thanks to you. Uh, a beautiful dissertation about a, a prevalent theme, uh, integrating all the ultrasound tools uh, invocated in this type of patients. Uh, hay algunas cosas que yo quisiera recalcar de esta excelente presentación. Uh, some things that I want to, to remark about your dissertation. Uh, Una de ellas, eh, la agudeza del ultrasonido pulmonar en relación a la radiografía de tórax, que es lo más clásicamente usado, eh, sobre el, el, el score de ultrasonido pulmonar y su relación con lo que es la, la sobrecarga intersticial pulmonar. Eh, one point is about the ultrasound, long ultrasound accuracy in relation to Radiography, the classic, the classic uh, uh, imaging tool in, in lung disease. Uh, about the approach of loose score and the interstitial water, about the, the, the lung overload, 
uh, some some detail about the hidden lung congestion prevalence and his relationship between the the pressure of the left ventricle. Uh, beautiful. Eh, otra cosa eh, importante que consideramos eh, que queda demostrada y que ha sido discutida en esta charla es la interacción en lo que es el eje corazón-pulmón eh, y, y la importancia precisamente de hacer estas valoraciones holísticas, de hacer estas, estas valoraciones multisistemas. Eh, another point, the interaction about uh, long heart axis, uh, the integration, uh, sometimes... Uh, Excuse me. Uh, right now, uh, we are talking so much about the cardiorenal syndromes. Uh, we have a new classification recently. Uh, and the importance of always evaluate uh, multiple compartments, uh, not isolated valorations, uh, not closing exactly. only okay. in abdomen, in thorax, no, o sea, exactly. Eh, exactly. look everything because eh, with this we have better results otra cosa que quería rescatar era la relación de, de los diámetros de la vena cava inferior y de las múltiples cosas o de los múltiples elementos que pueden inducir o incidir en el diámetro eh, tenemos el ejemplo el doctor Daniel García Gil internista español eh, bastante activo en redes y con bastante bibliografía que nos habla de la vena cava inferior como el falso profeta muchas veces cuando la tomamos eh, de manera aislada. Another thing, eh, the diameter of inferior cava vein and this relation with abdominal pressure, thoracic pressure, eh, I was talking Uh, of the opinion of Dr. Daniel Garcia Gil, uh, uh, internal medicine doctor from Spain. He thinks or he speaks about the inferior cavein as a false prophet when you use isolated, when you use only this parameter uh, yes. with, no, with no other uh, uh, elements. In this. Strongly agree, strongly agree. Y por último, eh, algo también que, que me agradó muchísimo, eh, hablar sobre la congestión renal, que es un término que vamos a tener que considerar eh, próximamente porque es una línea de investigación que, que promete muchísimo. And final point, the renal congestion, a uh, term to consider it. Eh, many articles, many rights in this team eh, right now, and the future is very promising in this uh, investigation route. Uh, one question, doctor, uh, general. Uh, how was the change of your practice in nephrology pre and post use of ultrasound in, in your patients in the, with end-stage renal disease? I think that it changed uh, basically uh, strongly as uh, It's very different to, as I've shown in, 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 my, in my presentation, that if you rely only on physical, physical examination, um, you lack something. There's something that you don't know. And this something you don't know is huge sometimes. Uh, as you can see in my, exam in, in my presentation, uh, when we study uh, the chest, for example, we have a lot a lot of uh, of aspect that we can we cannot uh, perceive um, growing in age for example our auscultation goes down <laughs> it's quite difficult to uh, perceive the crackles when you go go down when you uh, get older no and uh, with ultrasonography you have no problem you can see if there is something you can rule out uh, congestion if it, there are no B lines. I, I, in my mind, it was a sort of uh, uh, enormous achievement. But this is only an example. I, this, is, this achievement can be used in vascular access for, for, for time reasons. In, in this webinar, I, I could not talk of vascular access or for the study of congestion in other districts. Uh, with ultrasonography, uh, we can improve 
our uh, our the quality of our practice and uh, we can help really help our patients i have to say that now my prescription of ultra filtration is deeply connected with my uh, focus evaluation deeply yes. connected the, 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 the ultrasound gives you a real-time evidence. Uh, yes. You make the, the exam, you guide the, the therapeutics about the case. And, and yes. this gives you a lot of resources. Uh, si no tenemos preguntas, que parece que no tenemos preguntas, aparentemente todo ha quedado claro. Eh, quisiera despedirme entonces del doctor de Nicoló. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Uh, it was a great exposition on a topic of vital importance in clinical practice. And in the future, we are going to see more about uh, uh, congestion status. We are going to, to look more about cardiorenal syndrome and, and the use of ultrasound. It, it, it is beginning right now and for that reason this team is gold for us uh, thank you so much doctor uh, a pleasure it was a pleasure to, was a pleasure finally molto grazie <laughs> <laughs> y muchísimas gracias a todos los que están con nosotros actualmente por usted latinoamérica esperando hayan disfrutado la presentación del día de hoy que pronto estará eh, grabada y subida al canal de youtube que tengan un feliz sábado y esperando que haya sido del agrado de todos ustedes esta charla y disculpándome por el, por el manejo idiomático de inglés. Gracias a todos. Gracias a todos. Gracias a todos.